Today's lecture has no single equation in it. Good news. <laughs> um, and it follows up a lot from what we did yesterday. So it's still about overfitting. Yesterday we talked about how to use regularization to uh, prevent overfitting. And today this is uh, still on the same uh, line of thought. So when does overfitting occur? As we said yesterday, it occurs when we fit not only the underlying, let's say, true function that generated the data, but also the noise in the data, so specific things that happen in the specific individuals in our sample, which do not generalize across everyone, right? So um, yesterday we demonstrated overfitting using these polynomial models. You remember the first order and second order up to seventh order. And um, yep, I was wanting to ask you this, but I already said it, so there we go. Um, we used regularization to encourage simpler solution, right? And uh, do you remember other ways we talked about, uh, like simple ways of preventing overfitting? Anyone? If we have a large number of uh, covariates, what could we, could we do? Yep, well, that falls into regularization. So Lasso and Reads are regularization techniques. So we push our model to become simpler. But we could construct a simpler model to begin with, right? So have a linear model or a second order degree polynomial rather than a seventh order degree polynomial. Or we could just drop some of our covariates, the, the ones we think are less important, uh, and try to prevent overfitting this way. So. Okay, so we saw how to, to use regularization to do this, but now, if you remember in, in Lasso and in Ridge, we had that lambda parameter that weighted how much we penalize complex solutions, right? And today we're going to see how do we choose this, because we need to choose this somehow, right? Um, and here is an example, uh, another example, okay? So the, the, the green line here is the true underlying function, is, a, is a, a sinusoidal function. And these are data points, the blue dots, are data points generated from this function plus some random noise, okay? And this is, this red fit here, is what happens when we fit a ninth order polynomial, right? So you see that it goes through all the data points explicitly, but here we have a very uh, big dip, and there we have a very high curve, so we don't really believe that our model should be this complex. So now we put some reach penalty, right? So you remember, well, no equations in the lecture, but equations on the board. Yes. So, <laughs> so you remember we had um, our um, objective function was to minimize um, this, right? Sum over all the data points. And when we did reach, we had added this term here, right? The regularization. Okay, so what happens as we increase this value of lambda here is that um, basically we penalize complex solutions a lot. So these Ws will become smaller and smaller and smaller. And then what happens here is uh, we have one lambda and we see that the red line is starting to, it's still a ninth degree polynomial, right? But we have added some penalties now. So we see that now we don't actually pass through all the data points. And that goes, goes, uh, sorry, looks like a good approximation to the true, to the green line. Um, but then here, when we keep increasing the value of lambda, so we keep shrinking our weights, we see that we just can't capture, we, we can't fit our data anymore, right? We made it too smooth. So this red line here just misses the point, right? It's, it's not a good model either. So we somehow need to decide, do we have no lambda do, or zero lambda? Do we have, you know, what is the value of lambda that we should be using, right? And we need to somehow decide this. Does this make sense to everyone? Okay. So I don't remember what I want to say here. Let's see. <laughs> uh, so when we have models with many parameters, we can fit the train, training data exactly, right? We go through, we pass through every single data point here. Now, 
what this does, so if we ignore this term for now, what this does is it's going to minimize this function, right? So this error term between the true output and our model will become very, very small, right? But this happens only for what we call our training data, right? So this will happen only for the data that we consider in this function. So I here goes from 1 to n, and this holds for all the, you know, the errors of 1 to n data points will be minimized, but when we get data point n plus 1, then we might have a problem, right? So what we want is actually we want to predict this new data point, right? For these guys, we know what y is, we know the output, right? We've measured them. So we don't really want, we want to predict them. We want to predict n plus 1, the next individual that comes in, n plus 2, and so on. And we call this, so the error that we get for these guys, we call the generalization error, right? So the error or new individuals that have not been used as training. And what we're interested in, what we want to really maximize, is this generalization performance, right? So yes, we minimize the error in our training data, but what we really want to minimize in life is that the error that we make in these new data points. So how well can we predict new data? We just said this. Ah. Okay, so how could we do this? Again, I gave you the answer. <laughs> so anyone can say this who read very quickly? No, how, how could we go about and try and minimize the error for these guys? Some uh, i equals n plus one to whatever, and we have y i, same thing, right? So now we want to minimize this, but we don't, we don't know these guys now. Right. So we can't do it explicitly. Well, actually, from the data that we have measured, we want to set aside some of them for which we know the label, and then we can evaluate this expression. Right? So from our original data points, we want to split them and use some of them to train our model, minimize the error here, and then we can use the rest to see how well we do in new data points, right? But to do this, to, to be able to say how well we do in new data points, we need new data points that have labels, right? So they can't really be completely new in the sense that they come and we want to predict them. So we want to set aside some data for validation purposes, okay? We call this step validation. And what we're going to do is we're going to learn a lot of models with different lambdas. Okay, so we're going to use a number of different values for this one. And we're going to choose the lambda that gives the best performance on these new guys. Does this make sense to everyone? Good. Okay. And let's go back to our example. We're familiar with this now. Let's see what happens. So we have our 11 data points from yesterday. You remember this? And now we observe new data points. So these are the blue crosses, OK? So we have the linear fit. What do you think? Is this a good fit for the new data points? Do you think that predicts well? No, not really very well. You know, the differences of these guys from the line are quite big. What about the second order polynomial? So this is fitting, fitted using only the blue dots, right? The green things are, are new items, are new data points. So what do you think? Does this fit well? Reasonably well. I think we're, we're good here. It looks good to me anyway. Of course, it depends on the space, but yeah, it looks better than the previous one. What about the seventh order? Remember, it goes through our blue data points here and here and down there, but what about these guys, right? They're very far away from what we're predicting them to be, yeah? So this is overfitting, right? We can't really predict well. But what we want to do is basically, we want to select the order from these three guys, the order that minimizes the error 
on these green points, right? Because the error for the blue points is going to be minimized with this line that fits them exactly. Yeah? Good. So what happens is, this is a typical example of a training error and a validation or testing error. So in training error, as we increase the model power, so we allow more and more parameters to be fitted, the training error decreases and it's going to become zero. So at some point, we're going to fit the training data perfectly. This term here, without this, is going to become zero. Okay? And that is the blue line here. But then the, the validation error or the testing error is this red line. And what happens is we start off with a linear model. And it's not a very good model. You know, it's too simplistic for this data. And the error is high. And as we increase the model power, we decrease the error on the new data points. But after some point, we start overfitting the training data. We can no longer generalize. So we have this weird green curve here. And actually, the error on the validation data starts to increase again. So what would you say is a good point to stop increasing the, 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 the power of the model, the number of parameters in these curves? Can anyone come up and, and show me? Perfect. So we want to do it here, right? Somewhere here, where is the, yeah, the minimum, basically, of this function. Excellent. So how do we do this? Well, we're going to use uh, the easiest thing to do is to, to split our data. And we are going to use three data sets. Okay? So far, we talked about training data. And if we've talked about validation data. But actually, we also need a third data set, which is called the testing data. And we're going to see why we need this. Okay? But we have the training set. We use it to learn the model. Great. Then we have a validation set, and we use it to choose the optimal model from the number of models that we have tried, right? Which is the, the lambda, the best lambda, if we're regularizing, which is the, first, the best order of the polynomial. But then we need the third data set to check how well the chosen model performs, right? And why do you think this is the case? Why can we not use the error of this data? Can anyone think about this? It's along those lines, yes. So we want to, as from that, you want to get as much of an accurate estimate of how well you can do in the, in the real world as you can. Right? And you have a finite data set. You have the data that you have. Now, think of this. Training set, we learn model parameters. Okay? If we learn too many model parameters, what happens? We, we overfit our data. Validation set can be thought of as learning this parameter. Okay? So we're still fitting some aspect of the data. Okay? So the, the error, right? So if we take the lambda value that minimizes this, okay, this is not actually a true representation of the error that we will get for a completely new unseen data set. We have optimized something. We've made a decision with respect to this data. So we've seen this data. So we have fitted this data in one way or another. Right? So to get a, an accurate estimate of, uh, well, a, a more unbiased estimate of the performance we expect to see in completely new data set, then we need to use a data set that we have not used for any decision making. Right? Not for estimating the model parameters, not for choosing the model, not for choosing covariates, not for anything. Does this make sense to everyone? Yeah, because the error that we will see here is actually somehow optimal, right? So we've minimized the error that we observe here by fitting a number of different lambdas. OK, and here is just a, a representation we have. OK, let's say these are our data set. 
we can get 50% for training purposes and 25 and 25 for validation and testing, okay? Uh, depending on the application, how, much, how many data points you should use for each um, set varies. And next we're gonna, we're gonna see how to do it a bit more efficiently. So we, sh yeah, we said that. <coughs> so what happens if we only have very few data points, right? So imagine you have, I don't know, 100 data points and you wanna fit a model with 50 parameters or, okay, 20 parameters, but then you also need, you don't know what the model should be, so you need to choose something like this and you also want to estimate its performance, right? So what do you do? How would you go about doing this, right? If you split it 50, 25, 25, you're gonna only use 50 data points to train your model. That's not a very good idea. Plus, when you estimate your um, accuracy, so how well does your model predict, you only predict on 25 data points, so it could be that these data points are very easily predictable or very difficult to predict, and then you, you, know, you get a, a, a big variance of, of um, uh, your accuracy estimate, right? So what we can do or what people do is to use what we call cross-validation, okay? And what happens here, are you, have any, has anyone heard of this before? Yeah, okay, good. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna basically split the data points into equal parts, okay? So imagine this is all our data points and we can do something like this. So we split it in six parts and every time we're gonna leave one of these things out, we're not gonna use it and we're gonna train a model using everyone else, okay? Which is uh, what is happening here. So forget about this for a second and just think about these three. So we can do a split. We keep this yellow part out for testing purposes in the end. We don't touch it. And then we're left with this. And for this, we take each time a third, train on two thirds, make predictions on the, the other third, then train using these two guys, predict on this guy, train using these guys and predict on this guy, right? And then what we have done, we've, we've used a fairly large amount of data to train our model, so we believe that we've done the best we can do, let's say, or, um, um, you know, better than splitting this in half. And then we have predictions for actually all of our data, right? So we can estimate the accuracy of our model using predictions of all of these. So decide on the lambda using the full data set to some extent. But we need to be careful because obviously the models that we're gonna have from this, this, and this are gonna be slightly different, right? Because we use different data points to, to train them. So you need to, to be aware of this. And in the end, when we want to go to the testing phase, we basically use the predictions here to decide what is the lambda, what is the model we're gonna use. And once we choose the final model, then we, we take all of our data set together, all of the training data, and use it to train our model, and then estimate the, the accuracy on the testing set. Because we want to have as many data points in the estimation as possible. I'm a bit confused on when we decide the model and when the lambda. Deciding the lambda is deciding the model. But, okay. Mm. Yes, so you could have different stages and then you need to have more and more validation data set. But if you wanted to say, uh, have ridge models and lasso models, and each of these, you need to decide the lambda, okay? On the validation phase, you would test ridge with lambda equal one, with lambda equal two, with lambda equal three, and lasso with lambda equal one, two, and three. Then you have six choices. Then you use the prediction on the validation set, you choose one model, reads with lambda equals two is the best on this uh, validation data set, and then you go and use that, that is your final model. So it's model and kind of, the lambda is actually called often a meta parameter, right? So it's, a, it's part of the model definition to some extent, depending on how you see it. 
Is this clear now? But you could have, for instance, one validation step to select between lambda in lasso and lambda in ridge, and then compare these two in a new data set, and then a new, depending on how many data points you have. But you don't want to be doing the splits many times, because here you already train one, two, three, plus a fourth time. And people usually do five-fold cross-validation or 10-fold cross-validation. So here you would have five runs of your model plus one. And what we're going to see here, the next step is that we can also use nested cross-validation so that this part is also, has also more data points. Right? Because at the moment it only has, I don't know, what is this, 30% uh, of the data. So if your data, small, data set is really small, then you kind of want to cross-validate this somehow as well. Now you're happy? Yeah? Good. Other questions at this stage? No? We're almost towards the end, so you can ask questions. So nested cross-validation, the same principle, but now we um, basically split the testing part first, right? And now this, all of this thing, we're going to split and do five folds, say, or three folds in here to select the model parameters and three folds in here and three folds in there and so on. But here we have to start being careful because the models are become more and more difficult. So this procedure here could lead to a different lambda parameter than this procedure here for your testing. And you need to make some decisions but I'm not going to go into details uh, like in this lecture. And if you did this, then if you wanted to go and predict like real life people, what would you do as a next step? So you've done all this, you've estimated your testing error, you know what uh, your expected accuracy is, and someone says, okay, I want to use this for diagnostics or something like this, right? So what would be the next step to do? What model would you give them? Again, you kind of want to combine all of this and train a single model that uses all of your information, right? So the model you have decided, the model structure, let's say, you've decided reads with lambda equals x. For that model, you want to use all your data points to estimate its parameters. Mm -hmm. um, Right, so we're at the end. So here's a summary of what we looked at today. We've looked at how to select the model, and model here could mean model structure or model definition plus the metaparameters of the model, so the lambdas. We've looked at the difference between training and testing error, or more training and error in the training data and error in unseen data. You know, validation data could also be considered as unseen. Um, and, okay, this should say actually generalization performance. So I'm going to change it before I upload it. So we, we saw that the important thing that we want to really maximize is how well we predict at new data points. And we looked at cross-validation and nested cross-validation, okay? And I have some more reading for you here. So besides cross-validation, uh, other things you can use are bootstrap methods, and these are very interesting um, uh, for model selection, and there's a whole chapter, well, sub-chapter of this in, in, in our favorite book. <laughs> and again, I would like to acknowledge funding from my funders, which is Pharmatics, the VBSRC, and the Human Genetics Unit at the University of Edinburgh.